met a gypsy. That's really neat because I, all the best Australians had left, meaning Chad Reed, Michael Byrne, Andrew McFarlane. Uh, you know, they all came to Brett Metcalf. Yeah. They all left and left that sort of hole of, you know, yeah, there are aspiring kids, like you were naming Dean Ferris and all those guys, but they didn't have the direct leadership on a week-to-week basis or at the practice track of those those elite best guys ever to come out of Australia, you know, since Jeff Leask. Yeah. And um, so when the Lawrence brothers start popping up and then, you know, fast forward to the 2017 motocross of nations at Matterley Basin and, and Jet or Hunter beats Zach Osborne, uh, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, it was like, Whoa, who are these guys? So little did I know that Rick Zielfelder and Jeff Myshack, yeah, yeah. and that means Ziggy yeah. and Christian Craig's father-in-law, yeah. who owned Geico Honda together, decided to go to Europe because they wanted to sign Hunter Lawrence. You know, they'd seen him at the Des Nations, so they go over, and I, 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 I think it was in the middle of that season, um, or the next season, and uh, it's about that time they realize it's a package deal. And and sight un Bummer. sight unseen, they sign Jet Lawrence, a fourteen year old, to a development deal, and they're not even going to get him for two years. You know, and and uh, and the, that race was I want to say it was uh, it was Erne or Saint Jean d'Angely, and um, uh, Jet gets like seventeenth. You know, and he's I like, actually remember that. Yeah, he gets like a seventeenth and nineteenth, and I'm like, man, yeah. What? It, this is going to be like Mike and Jeff Alessi. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. a package deal, but it might be holding Hunter back. Yeah. Um, but then by the end of that year, uh, at Lomel, uh, they have the last EMX race in Jets, like two seconds faster than kids that are two years older than him. And I'm like, huh? Yeah. You know, so uh. so so the next year, uh, Jet uh, shows up in America for the Minios, and he's going to ride in the schoolboy class and the A class. I don't even care remember where it is. And I'm watching and I'm thinking, man, this kid's really good. Like, like, look really good. And then he comes to the right of lens. And so I, I'm out in the infield and I'm watching and he's in practice and I'm, I'm like, man. And Ziggy walks up to me and he goes, say, he's, what do you see? Yeah. What do you see? I was like, ah, he looks a lot like John Michelle Bale. And he's like, yep. And I was like, and he even had a, a handkerchief in his in his pants because it was it was muddy, and everything about him just looked like JMB. And so uh, Ziggy was at the race this weekend. And oh, uh, cool! Yeah, and and I introduced him to Sam Jones, and we were yep, walking around yep. talking, and they're just talking about you too. They just love music, and Sam's buddies with them, and all that, and you know, and and uh, and then uh, Sam's like, so what do you do? And and like and, and Ziggy's like, well, you know, and I do this, and, and I'm like, wait a minute, this guy has the best eye for talents and Scott Taylor. He's the one, sight unseen, who signed Jet Lawrence when he was a 14-year-old kid living in Ken Roxon's basement. Crazy. <laughs> and Sam eh? Sam's like, that sounds like a movie. And I was like, Yeah, you know, it, it was anyway. Um But man, it was it was so crazy. Like I have memories of Jet on a 60 mm-hmm. lapping the entire field in a four lap race mm-hmm. and it's like they were good kids you know like they were good they, they were privateers yeah they're all <laughs> hey we're all privateers at some point <laughs> but he's literally get another tear off that he, he uh he would literally wrap uh lap the entire yeah. on a 60 in a four lap race and it was just and that was always the thing it, it, in australia yeah. it was like oh Wait till you see Hunter's little brother. Wait till you see yeah. Hunter's little brother. Well, like he was just always a freak of freaks. Well, the, the the reason I even brought it up is because to your point about Ryan Dungey, Ryan Dungey was so far off the radar that people didn't know how to pronounce his name. Yeah, you know, he was not uh, you know the can't miss kid. He was not Mike Alessi or any of those hot shots of the early OOs of you know in the mini classes at Loretta's or Minios or Mammoth Mountain. He was just some kid from Minnesota, and it made zero sense that DeCoster would sign him so early mm. to this deal. Uh, and so it, it 
at least we got to see him start to evolve with Jet. It was one of the sight unseen things. Yeah. And and you know, I had a front row seat when um, John Michelle Bale showed up at Gatorback and and put it to everyone. And everyone was like, "Who is this guy?" And I I'd, I'd been watching him because he yeah. was a huge GP fan, and I knew what he was capable of. But I didn't know he was capable of that. That. Yeah. And 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 then you know, Jeremy McGrath in 1993, you. When when that that eureka moment or that that breakout moment happens, uh, with with Dungey it was a little more uh, of a of a of a evolution. Uh, with with uh, with Jet a little more of an evolution, but shorter. Um, but that you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is you 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 never know. You know, I, I remember watching Mike Alessi and thinking that's the best minicycle rider I ever saw. I remember watching Adam Cincerula and thinking the exact same thing. I remember being corrected by people saying, no, James, James Stewart was the best mini bike rider ever. And he probably was. But the point is. Um, it's not it, always the yeah, perfect guy. Yeah. You, 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 but Jeremy McGrath was none of that. Mm. And, and Jeremy McGrath was a, a kid bag and groceries at a Ralph's that rode BMX. And um, I, you know. Quick one, one more funny story. I can remember the day I met Jeremy McGrath. Really, High Point Raceway, putting stakes up in the pro section the day before the national, and my friend Gary Semex comes walking up the hill with this kid, and the kid had like, like MSR electric blue shorts and like a you know the fuchsia color you know just a, a kind of chubby kid. I know who he was, and Gary's like, hey, you need a hand. You know, and, and Gary was, you know, a motocross coach. And I was like, who's this? He goes, oh, this is my buddy, Jeremy. He, I'm coaching him now. He's, he's riding. And I'm like, Jeremy, he goes, yeah. He goes, he, you know, he won a Supercross this year in Las Vegas. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, the Team Green kid. He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, I, Jeremy McGrath walks around holding stakes. And we talk for 20 minutes while we work on this section. There's no way in hell that guy really was the Jeremy McGrath that showed up a couple years later. Because he just didn't look it, he didn't sound it. You would never have guessed that there he was, the future king of Supercross, uh, the best there ever was in Supercross, uh, and just so humble, so quiet, so you know. It, it, it. it uh, I love those stories. We don't get them enough. The world's a smaller place, so we see these guys. Yeah, sooner. they're under a microscope a lot quicker a lot and quicker. Earlier. Yeah, but but I, I guess that the you know. All of this, whether it's how good Triumph did their first day, how good that Yamaha did in its first Supercross, how good Jeremy became, how you know what Dungey became, what the Lawrence brothers became, uh, that is the stuff I live for. Oh yeah, day to day. I, I I I you know I hate the stories of guys getting hurt. I hate the stories of people going out of business. I hate uh, the the bullshit that comes sometimes with the. Uh, you know, the internet and, and uh, all of the politics. But at the end of the day, we're all just a bunch of enthusiasts. Like you said, we're all privateers. We're yeah. all, there's not a lot of real professionals here. Uh, you know, I don't think Lucas Myrtle decided to be a super agent. I think he became one because he's got great street sense. He's got a great eye for talent, just like Steve Astafin did, mm -hmm. just like Scott Taylor did back in the day, just like Jeff Sirwall you know, had that magic touch back in the day. Um, all these guys started out as enthusiasts yeah. and found a role for themselves because it wasn't on the podium. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was working their way up, finding a way to contribute, and then continuing to keep this thing spinning. Yeah. You call it a pie, I call it a carousel, but yeah. we're talking about the same thing. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy Gang.